and that's going to be followed by the Northwest uh, University, as well as our final presentation will come from Seaport. So, Mzwandile Kumalo, Mzwandile is our first uh, presenter for the day, and I'm going to just give him an opportunity to start sharing his presentation. Mzwandile, are you good to start sharing? Thank you so much. Uh, Mzondile, I'm also going to ask you to please introduce yourself if you don't mind. And then you may begin. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much and a very good morning, colleagues. I hope that I am audible and my screen is showing as well. If I may please get a confirmation. You are audible and we can see your screen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, colleagues, my name is Mzwani Lekumalo and I work at the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at DUT as the Teaching, Learning and Development Practitioner. And I am also then coordinating the Student Academic Support and Development Units, um, which uh, consists of a number of programs that includes the first year student experience um, tutorial services, the resident educational program, academic advising, technology for learning, which is an integral of the first year student experience program, and a number of other activities that we do. Um, I'm just going to show my face very quickly, and I will then um, uh, uh, mute my, my camera as well, uh, particularly for connectivity, um, but also just so that you don't um, uh, uh, get enough of my face during the presentation. Okay, so I will kickstart my presentation by just sharing how the whole um, um, uh, FYSE program actually fits within the strategic direction of the university, which is where we've, we have strongly embedded this initiative. And particularly it's with the idea that we are developing uh, students in a cumulative way. And um, there's then certain sort of indicators that we focus on, particularly for students at first year, um, which mainly would be around transition and adaption. But importantly, um, the Envision 2030 strategy of, of DUT, uh, it also speaks of the idea that we are um, trying to make sure that our people are creative, innovative, entrepreneurial. Hi, colleagues, if you may please mute. Colleagues, please, can you mute yourself? There are a few yeah. of you who are not muted, and um, you please need to mute. Sorry, Ephraim, thank you. Okay. So the whole idea then is that um, Envision 2030, and particularly the statement of intent, gives us a very clear point of arrival in terms of where we want to see our students at by the time they graduate. And um, I'm just gonna highlight a few of the strategic objectives that then uh, sort of fits into the program, uh, the, first, the first year experience program. Um, so the way that we read the strategic direction of the university is that we read it from bottom up. So starting from stewardship, and stewardship particularly speaks of the idea that we need to have shared values and principles. And so that is why then um, as part of the topics that we have there is around the values and principles of the university, because the idea is that we want to share, um, both staff and students need to share and create an identity for the university. And it's with the idea that the, identity of the university itself is actually embedded on its people, both staff and students. And so uh, you'd find that there's a lot of work that we are doing around inculcating um, this, this idea of common and, and, and lived uh, values um, um, sort of principles that we work, we work with. So they have been uh, sort of highlighted from here, if you can see that we speak of uh, transparency, honesty, honesty, integrity, respect, accountability, fairness, professionalism, commitment, compassion, and excellence. And then we also want to dwell very much on the institutional culture 
uh, strategic objective, which speaks of the idea of um, fostering a culture of accountability and shared responsibility in achieving the DUT way. And then the other strategic objectives that we dwell so much on would be the distinctive education and then ultimately adaptive graduates, where we speak of the idea of developing graduates with the acumen to initiate or respond to changes. Um, you would notice that as I go through the presentation, I'll touch on student agency, which is part of the work that we are doing. I'll touch on uh, design thinking as a methodology, which we have used to co-create with, with, with students. And I'll speak also in terms of how really we have worked with students in shaping and developing the first year experience program and how then we actually make the statement of intent of the university a living um, sort of statement other than it be just a statement that is on, um, that is just in, in, in black and white. Okay, so drawing closer now to what I've just touched on, um, where the program sits is on adaptive graduates, the stewardship perspective and distinctive education. And the idea is that we want to holistically develop students with the agency to influence decisions, engage in critical dialogues and innovative and, and be innovative and also um, have global relevance. So at an institutional level, that's, that's where we are. But in terms of now the work that we do, um, we, we first, really dwell much on the idea, um, um, perhaps first that we have moved away as a university from the approach of being student-centered, um, but we are now sort of a people-centered university. And the idea of being people-centered was that, in fact, both staff and students have a role to play towards the realization of the strategic direction of the university. And secondly, um, students for the longest of time, they sort of looked at themselves as entitled people to which then just the university will have to give them information um, and really support them in any way that they possibly, that we possibly can support them. But they didn't look at themselves as people who have a role to play um, towards their own learning, towards their own sort of sense of belonging and, and also towards their own success as well. So that was the first, first position that the university uh, sort of assumed to say, we want to be a people-centered university instead of a student-centered university because all the stakeholders within the university have a role to play towards us achieving um, our goals as a university. So secondly, we then spoke of the idea that we do not want to look at students as um, sort of underprepared, but we are looking at students as differently prepared. The idea is that we have to know then as a university where we're we picking our students from, what sort of knowledges do they come to the university with, what sort of skills do they come to the university with, and how can we cultivate those skills and, and behaviors in such a way that would really benefit um, the university itself. Colleagues, I'm going to request um, if you may please mute yourselves. Thank you. Um, so the first thing that we have to do is to understand where we are picking our students from, and then this would then influence the kind of initiatives that we actually do. So we have sort of identified students in the four quadrant. The first quadrant speaks of the idea that these are students who are more concerned about the self, who are disconnected, who are finding the university alienating, who have no sense of accountability, um, who really do not find themselves belonging to the university space. And so the way that we are identifying the students, these are the students who don't attend classes. These are the students who would go on strikes at any time that they want to do so. These are the students who cause any form of disruptions really within the university. And secondly, we have students that are focusing more on their grades and achievements. Uh, and these are the students that would do really well at first year, probably getting distinctions because the, the kind of assessments there are sort of more of just regurgitation and producing exactly um, um, what you'd have studied. These are the students who cram, these are the students who would really just um, sort of focus more on their studies more than being engaged and having a sense of sort of the holistic um, um, development. 
And then on the third quadrant, these are the students who have a good sense of active participation and who really has a, a pride of being part of DUT with a very good sense of belonging to the university as well. Students uh, in this quadrant, uh, the students who are also involved in sports, who are involved in all other activities really that we have as a university. And then lastly, where ultimately as a university, we want to see our students at, is that we want to see our students to have a good sense of active participation, um, who have holistic growth. That means these are the students who take care of their development, um, who also are part of other activities that are happening within the university. And these are the students who are doing well uh, academically, but then also who are able to apply the knowledge that they would have learned in the classroom um, so that really they develop to be professional uh, students other than just, you know, um, um, people that will probably just graduate with the qualification, but who would not be able to apply the knowledges that they actually have learned in class. So I've plugged also some of the theories then that we are using um, and, and frameworks that we are using towards um, really working around this work. So in essence, colleagues, um, we run then, um, I'm trying now to draw much more closer to the FYSE program. We have identified these four pillars. Um, so we speak of campus and academic transition, which really speaks of the idea of inculcating uh, this sense of belonging and nurturing students into the university as well. But then also there's work that we are doing around training and development and academic excellence, uh, engagement and active participation, and also inclusion and integration. So why is, are these um, the, the, the main four pillars? The idea is that here we need to make sure that we are creating an, an environment that is enabling and that is enhancing for students. And every student must sort of find themselves belonging to the university, but then also importantly, as we work towards the institutional culture and us having uh, shared lived values and principles, we, we have to make sure that we nurture the students so that they find the university to be as welcoming as it possibly can be. But then we understand that the work doesn't only end there because the way that we are developing our students, it should be holistic. So there's also a lot of work that needs to be done simultaneously around uh, training and development in terms of the kinds of skills that first year students would, would require for them then to grow into becoming then um, what we would have called adaptive graduates as a university. But then also we do track their active um, engagement and involvement in either sports or any other activities that are happening in the residences um, or activities that are happening institutionally. So that we really see that the students are actively involved, they are participative, and they very much are um, engaged as we would want them to be. And then lastly, um, and this again also draws from Envision 2030, and we speak of the idea of understanding our students as developing human beings. Uh, and so understanding that the students have challenges that are, are beyond just the academic uh, engagements that they have, but we really need to make sure that we take care and we understand all kinds of challenges that the students have and actually then provide interventions that um, uh, are required. So I spoke of the idea of the fact that we want to make sure that we know where we're picking our students from. And I will now share a few sort of sources of data that helps us then to shape the FYSE program that we implement. But we use data um, um, to collect this kind of information and then provide the interventions after. So what we do during the orientation program and really just early as students are receiving um, they are sort of uh, confirmation of statuses for them to study with us. We then share some data that we collect. So this would include the Buse survey, it will include the Knowing Our Students survey and other uh, surveys that I will share. So you, you, this already gives us an idea in terms of what are the helps that students think they would require um, when they registered for the different programs where, where this program is their first choice, um, was DUT their first choice? Do they have any sort of form of disabilities? Uh, this particularly is for students with disabilities. How are their skills in terms of the use of learning management systems? And then also their first generation status and the use of um, numerical uh, sort of work. 
and a whole lot of other really important data that we collect. And then through the first year student, ex um, the first year experience survey, we then check in terms of how well prepared the students are, their source of funding, the sense of belonging at the time when they come to university, and what kind of initiatives would they want us to implement. This would include um, coming again from students in terms of skills uh, development and entrepreneurship, well-being and emotional support, leadership, career path knowledge and proper induction to financial world, and, and, and. and this then sort of speaks to the kind of initiatives then or topics that we cover through the first day experience. And more data um, that speaks to the retention of first time entering students so that we really have an idea of where we are sitting as a university and how we are doing. And then in terms of the throughput and, 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 and dropout rates as well. So the first year of student experience at DUT, it covers mainly three components. It has psychosocial uh, component, the academic component, and also the technological um, component. And so I'll just uh, speak briefly then on the kinds of programs that we do. So right at the beginning of the year, we designed the first year orientation program, which is a five days program. And really here we are just giving students a brief overview of what is happening at DUT in terms of which days did they attend, how was the orientation program itself, and how really did it benefit them in terms of um, um, <clears throat> the work that we do. So we have themed the different days of the orientation, uh, starting with day one being the vice chancellor's welcome address. And here we invite parents as well who then sort of get to know what DUT is all about and what we are doing. Then day two is on campus health and safety. Day three, um, finances, scholarship and entrepreneurship. And then day four, becoming a DUT student. And that is where now all the different um, uh, departments and units that would be working with students, mainly from student services or student affairs or even academic support would do a lot of their presentations. And then the last day is an interfaculty sport day. So we then evaluate the program and see if from right from the orientation, there is some contribution that we have made. And so part of the open-ended questions that we asked then during the orientation is what has been the most beneficial part of you being part of orientation? So you'd see that students were saying, I was nervous about my class and other DUT stuff, but since I was present in the orientation, all my questions were answered and they taught me clear about everything, including writing center, tutorials, and, and, and. The most beneficial part of the orientation is when the peers who are at higher level of education told us about us, uh, about, um, about us to be ourselves and value education and getting educated rather than worrying about what to wear and whom to see. Uh, we were told about writing center and cult. So already you'd see that there's um, sort of work that we are doing towards integrating students into the university and making them aware of the different kinds of initiatives that we actually offer as a university. And then moving from there, because again, I think it's important for me to say that the way that we view orientation um, and the first year experience program is that it actually is a continuation of the orientation program itself. Uh, so it starts from the orientation and then from there we work with the students for the entire year and really trying to integrate them into the university. So these are different topics that we cover. The first one would be about um, students being champions for Envision 2030 so that they understand their own role as well in the realization of the strategic direction of the university. Uh, becoming a NOAA, this is where um, the senior tutor mentor advisors, which I must say that we appoint from the specific departments and the FYSE program then works in different ways for different faculties. So some of the faculties have the FYSE program uh, timetabled and we are given one hour weekly. And then the senior student from that particular department would then be appointed and would work with the students um, in addressing sort of faculty specific uh, needs of the students. And then becoming a NOAA is more about teaching students really the study skills um, and how to make meanings of the knowledge that they would have learned so that they are able to apply it to um, exams and assessments. 
And then managing myself and time, this is more on uh, time and scheduling skills. And then know your cash campaign. Um, this is mainly on financial literacy. Um, and I think this was introduced, I think two years back, this topic was, it was introduced two years back, particularly because um, we realized that um, when students um, uh, through NSFAS, of course, they started receiving, receiving their funds uh, through their own account, we realized that right or during the time of them receiving their funds, uh, students are not coming to class, they're drinking a lot, and yet, as a university, we have a, a food insecurity uh, uh, challenge, and there's quite a number of programs that we have done there. So we felt that it's very important and compulsory that we do a session where we train students on how to be financially savvy. And then the living values framework, um, this, of course, draws from Envision 2030, and then self-studying made easier. This is more of a uh, self-studying techniques and skills, um, and then the exam preparation workshop, technology for learning, where we're training them on how to use the learning management systems that we have at DUT. So this one is actually a sort of um, collaborative effort where we even invite the library to, to train students on how to access information using the, their own search engines. And then we train students on how to submit assessments using Moodle, we train students on how to use Microsoft Teams as a platform that we have actually adopted, particularly for collaborations and for um, other sessions as well. So this is more of the practical side of the work that we do. But then also there may be uh, special webinars or seminars that are facilitated by the respective teaching, learning and development practitioners. And this is through a request from that particular department to come and facilitate a session. So you'd find that they would want us to engage with students and try to understand what are their challenges and work with them towards uh, improving um, their challenges as well, because we, we you'd find that there's a module that students are struggling with, but it's not really well understood as to what are some of the challenges that the students are facing as they seem to be not doing well in that module or we may be invited to facilitate a special webinar or seminar on a topic that would have been chosen by the department themselves. And then we have created information sharing platforms on Moodle and Microsoft Teams. And this is where we just share um, guides. So you'd find that in terms of the learning management systems and the use that in, we have created a guide um, which we then post on the platform. But if there are any surveys or any communications that are specific to first year students, we then use those platforms to communicate with them. If there's any um, sort of work that we have developed, it could be through a presentation that we would have done perhaps with a group of students, but we want to share it with the entire students as well so that they also can learn. Um, we, we, we post this on this platform and we track then as to how often do students actually access um, the, 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 the classroom as well, so that we see how they are engaging, um, at least with the information that we post there. And then some of the engagements then that we have with the students is to try to understand and build with them their ultimate goals as they join DUT. And we work with this also um, with the tutor mentor advisors. So you'd see that we sort of create an idea that as you are at first year, but you really need to see yourself and set goals for yourself that you would want to achieve and that you want to work towards. And we then create storyboards or we create um, even schedules for them so that they, they then can uh, sort of live up to those goals. So you'd see that students would, would share that they see themselves um, as a student who is willing to do anything to perform creating their modules, no matter what they want to achieve their, their, their goals. The idea is to maximize my potential, use all the resources afforded to me by the institution, not only in education, but um, by mind as well. Um, that by, by that I mean, I understand the institution is a people-based institution and it seeks to fully develop a student holistically, even though that cannot happen in one year but my wish is to build on that foundation in this year for the coming years. And ultimately um, my end goal is to get a cum laude on record time 
and um, the work of course starts now. So already through the activities that we do with the students, we, we really try to make sure that we inculcate this sense of agency, we, incul we inculcate student agency so that they also realize that they have a role to play towards their own uh, goals and their own achievement as well. Um, some of the questions that we would have asked then the tutor mentor advisors that are working with students, they would say that the students are young and ambitious forerunners who are on their way of unlocking their potential and achieve success. And I would like to see them being employed in big organizations that allows them to learn and grow as individuals. We want them to be best people as they possibly can be, uh, to be not only academics, but ethical people who can value, uh, who can add value to humanity. So you would already see that there's a direct link with the way that we are doing um, or the way that um, we, we make sure that we train students on um, the strategic goal of the university. Um, another student said, I see myself as an upcoming lecturer at DUT because I love sharing what I know to others. I also want to be able to overcome any challenges that might occur along the way, personal or not. Getting a, a peace job could also come in handy since the NSFAS monthly living allowance is not enough. Um, and then the kind of supports that students said they need in terms of academic support, um, they require extra lessons, um, group one-on-one -on -one with the lecturer, homeworks to check the student progress and live um, and live tutoring to help in more communication and understanding, keep track of student participation, coaching and nature. Um, sorry about that and uh, enhance student academic journey through mentoring and advising, and then career advising, which includes um, working hard to achieve their goals. And then um, once we have offered then the workshops that we offer, then on a semester base, we then try to evaluate as to how far have we really helped the students and how far have we contributed to the work that the students are actually doing and how we contribute also to their academic performance as well. You'd see that students would say, uh, in terms of reflecting on their first few weeks of the university, we asked them how often did they feel lonely, uh, feel that the university is not friendly, uh, felt that um, they didn't belong to DUT. And some of the open-ended questions uh, in terms of how really um, um, their experience was during the first few weeks or first few months of, of the university. They've shared that it started scary because uh, if it's a new uh, uh, surrounding and new and a new environment. As time went by, I adopted good. I was adamant at first. Uh, the work was high, but I managed. I passed all my modules, although with no good marks, and I aim to excel the second semester. And I'm more comfortable and familiar with the DUT's um, learning systems. And then one student also shares that in the first three months, as a DUT student, I found transitioning from high school to be uh, to university relatively smooth. I have thrived in the new environment. I found that DUT's incorporation of technology and physical teaching is very effective and conducive to learning. The resources DUT provides to students, uh, such as the learning material, library resources, tutorials, clinical support, transportation from campus, play a big role in my academic success and campus uh, experience. So this then gives us an idea really as to how well have the program uh, on, on you know, integrating students into the university has actually done and how we then need to improve um, moving to the, the following year. And then this is just gener um, 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 a general overview of the program, um, which we then collect at the end of, of the year um, to see if really we have worked with students around um, inculcating the sense of belonging and if the FYSE seminars are improving their knowledge and skills that contributes to their discipline because we've also been very specific to say we want to offer an FYSE program that is specific to the kinds of knowledges that students are, are enrolled in and we need to offer it as a supplementary tool to disciplinary knowledge than it being just a generic um, sort of uh, session that the students have to attend. Um, this was particularly very important because I'll share later um, how we constantly improve the FYSE program using the design thinking methodology as we work with the students themselves. Um, 
So it's important because the FYSE program is actually non-credit bearing at DUT. And so really, we mainly are dependent on the relevance of the program and how the students see it contributing to their success um, that we actually then can, can um, really know that we are making the impact that we want to make. And I must say that uh, through taking this direction and, and engaging with students and using the student voices in the design and implementation of FYSE has really helped us because before it was mainly sort of a prescriptive topics that we cover, but then now we are very much flexible to really work proactively, but also reactively as well um, as we design the program with the students in the different faculties and different departments. Um, and so this then has increased the participation from as low as less than 50%. And as is right now, uh, in 2023 alone, we have supported at least, and we are working with at least 92% of the first year student uh, of the first year students. Um, DUT as is takes um, the uptake for first year students is 8,600, and we've supported and we're working with plus minus um, 8.2 ish um, um, first year students in the FYC program, and out of the eight. Um, webinars on average the student would have attended at least five or six of those webinars as well and we keep track of the student um, attending or attendance to the program itself. So some of the open-ended questions then in terms of how the FYSE has assisted them to benefit academically you'd see that students would share that the work helped me to understand my work better or that rather the tutors have helped me understand my work uh, my school work better and how my modules link to one another. And this is the academic component uh, part of the FYSE program. Effective time management and study skills, part of the psychosocial component. Seeing senior students talk about their first year challenges and experiences, it helps me when it comes to critical thinking and improve academically. And uh, some of the aspects of, in terms of um, the improvements that we need to take on the FYSE program, you'd see that students have said that the time allocated is too short, um, working using technology and also show some videos, which we have improved, I think, on this, because this was data that we collected last year. And then the time allocation as well, which is still a problem, of course, because uh, some of the faculty have really, really packed um, timetables and for them to give us an hour um, weekly is a bit of a struggle. So, so some of the faculties have chosen to have sort of special webinars that we then sort of send out a call for, and then they register for those sessions, but it's not necessarily timetabled. And some of the faculties then um, have stuck to the idea of having the FYSE sessions uh, timetabled. And then in terms of what motivated students to attend the seminars, uh, students spoke of being taught by such hardworking and young mentors kept me motivated. I wanted to learn more about my program and what it does in the real world. Uh, missing improvement in my academics and the seminars have been really helpful. My safety, how to deal with stress, how to approach certain situations in varsity. And the seminars were fun and exciting. And it's an open discussion about social and educational issues. So colleagues, I spoke of the idea that we use design thinking to co-create uh, the FYSE program with, 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 with the students themselves. And this then sort of helps us to keep track and to make sure that we remain relevant to the program. Um, so we engage with the students to identify challenges and then ask them to explore ways as to how we can improve the program. We do this a uh, few months into the program and also as we prepare for the second semester or in preparation for um, um, the following year. So some of the things that we really want to work on in terms of understanding what students understand as student success, um, and really to know that the, pro the program itself actually is contributing to the success of students. We then ask them of what do they think is the definition of student success. And so students come up with um, really nice ideas of what student success is. And this then helps them also to understand what is it that they need to achieve for them um, to really be as successful as they want they want to be um, within DUT. And so these are some of the definitions of student success that the students themselves have come up with. 
and some of the work that we have done in terms of um, working on the first year experience program, you'd realize that this was work that was done by students in terms of how we can improve the FYSE program. So students spoke of the idea that um, online learning affects um, 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 the attendance and the students knowing about the program. Um, and these them just exploring different ideas of what really is the challenge. So they spoke of lack of awareness of the program. And some, some even said that uh, the program was initiated a long time ago and probably it's no longer as relevant to the newer students, uh, no one um, to approach regarding the program. So uh, the idea here is that they did not know where to go to find the program. Uh, the program held by the FOSE does not meet the schedules of students leading to clashing of times. Um, of course, this is based on, you know, the different sort of uh, faculties and departments that the students are actually in. So some, as I've said, um, we do the programs based on lecturers requesting us to do the sessions or inviting us or even through the call then. But it's important to say that the FYSE program is non-credit bearing and therefore students attend as in when they, they want to, but we want to make sure that we at least target them for at least six, five to six um, uh, uh, seminars per year um, for us then to really claim that we actually have contributed to um, them improving their sort of sense of belonging and, and creating this enabling environment at DUT. So these are some of the challenges that the students themselves have, have, have come up with. Another group came up with an idea of how can we make the information um, readily available? So they came up with an app and we have now actually done this app um, and it will first be rolled out the following year uh, in 2024. And the main thing that students had highlighted here, um, these are first year students, of course, they highlighted that um, it's very difficult for them to locate venues. And so um, sometimes they look at the timetable, but it doesn't give them enough descriptors in terms of where actually are the venues. So now what we have done, we've created this app where if you type the room, um, the, the, the lecture venue, it gives you which campus the, the, the venue is, which floor and which building you need to go to. And it will give you also a picture of that building as well. And then also in terms of the, information sharing um, sort of strategy in terms of students having to really have the information at their fingertips. We have sort of divided the work to say academics, this is where you'll find mainly faculties, and then the student support and development um, units and the work that they do, campus locations and um, information on what to, to um, uh, um, sort of find in terms of who to contact if you need help. And then in terms of the student support and development, this is the page now where it's, ex it's expanded. So instead of just naming departments, we have used the pillars to say, in terms of student support and development for success, in terms of academic support and skills development, active participation, well the technological um, um, support as well. So what has worked and what has not worked um, so collaborations, I think, have been very, very, very key, and the use of the student voice to design the webinars and seminars has really helped us in terms of the uptake of the program, and then strong partnership with the departments and faculties, and uh, again, as I've shared, that some faculties um, have opted to timetable the FYSE webinars, and some we do in a form of a call where they book for special uh, seminars, and the booking um, uh, is actually done by the departments and faculties. And then the institution-wide collaboration, because some of the themes that we cover under the FYSE programs are actually provided by um, other departments and not necessarily the tutor mentor advisor. So this would include mental health um, uh, trainings and, and, and. Then the challenges um, is the competition for time with departments, especially for those faculties that are, that have, timetable that is really pegged. Um, the program is not credit, credit bearing and thus inconsistent atten attendance. And this is really based on the idea that students, sometimes they do attend the program, but if they have assessments or, or assignments that they need to attend, 
they then have an option to not attend. Um, and then some of the departments have no interest in the program because um, they feel that they actually, um, it's not really relevant to their own students as well. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Ms. Andile. We've got 10 minutes for comments, questions, anything you'd like to ask Ms. Andile about the DUT um, initiatives. Colleagues, the floor is now open. I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, I think um, there's a question on how was the attendance and marketing of all the sessions or program. Um, so how we do this, colleagues, is that we we use the DUT um, communication platform, which is called Pinboard, in terms of sharing about the program itself. But also through the orientation program, we make sure that we actually communicate that um, orientation does not end in that one week, but it's going to be a continuation of the of the. Uh, uh, there's going to be other sessions that would follow, which are part of the FYSE um, programs then. And then also in the departments where it is um, timetabled, it makes it much more easier for us because already the students would see that they have these sessions. And then for the departments that are that, that choose to then just register for certain uh, sessions, what we do is we create a call with specific dates. So each of the TLDPs, uh, teaching learning development practitioners, together with their tutors, they would decide on specific dates and time. And the department, um, the different departments would then have to register for these sessions. And they then inform their students that students have to attend um, these sessions in this particular venue. So working mainly with the departments, uh, with staff has really, really, really helped us. And then in terms of the actual engagement with students, particularly around how we improve the sessions, again, we send out a call to the departments to say on this particular day, we'll have a design thinking workshop and we use then FYSE as a case study on how to improve it. Um, and then we work with RSVPs mainly so that we have an idea as to how many students would attend um, the sessions. So yeah, it really then just helps us in, in, in knowing how many students would attend and how many we need to, to meet in terms of um, the sessions themselves. And, and, and what we then do is we, we track the student participation. So the way that we have done and designed our, our, our registers is that it needs to show us, so the registers themselves, we put uh, in terms of gender, we, we put uh, in terms of the faculty, we put in terms of departments as well. And then we have data capturers who capture um, these registers in an Excel spreadsheet. And then in that way, we know how many times we have reached a student from which department and which then of, of the um, um, approximately eight to 10 webinars that or seminars that we expect them to attend, um, um, how many of those sessions they would have attended. Um, the last part which I, which I have not shared because we're still waiting for this data is that we then take those registers or rather that Excel spreadsheet, we send it to MIS and they need then to give us an idea of how the students that have attended the program and that have attended a certain number of the webinars are actually performing academically in comparison to the students that would have not attended the sessions at all or would have attended fewer sessions. In that way, we are very careful to not claim that we have completely contributed to the success of students and the enhanced academic performance, but we say we have made some contribution as well, looking at how the stats actually are, are saying to us. So on average, looking at previous years, we're looking at uh, an, an average um, performance of, or rather the difference is plus minus 10% um, really at most. Um, where the students that have attended the sessions actually perform better than those that do not attend the session. Yeah, thanks so much, colleagues. Thank you so much, Ms. Wandile. Quick question for you, this acronym, F-Y-S-E, can you explain it for us? The? Acronym that you're using, your F-Y-S-E. Oh, it's first-year student experience. Right, so, so you put the student 
first yes. year student experience. Okay, that's yes. interesting. All right, colleagues, are there no further comments or questions? There is one from uh, Sue just commending Zwantile on the interactive sessions and also um, commending the fact that the tutoring okay, is used to facilitate your uh, your initiative. Um, I'm just asking, there's another, is that a next, is there a comment or question here? Let me just quickly look. Okay, somebody asking, let's see, Tracy, sir, uh, asking, did you develop the app, the class locations in-house? Was there a, a great cost involved? I spent a great deal of time redirecting students to collect offices and explaining where our office is, which is Student Support Services here at UK's at Random Zone Dealer. Mm. What we have done actually, we worked with the um, InnoBiz office, so the entrepreneurship office, and they helped us to identify students who sort of have businesses on um, um, sort of app developments. And then um, this student then was, was elected as the leader of the project, who then worked with other students from the IT department. So there were no costs in, in the development of the program. Um, the actual prototype was developed by students themselves. And then the actual finalization of the program was then uh, through the app factory. So this would be the, the staff in ITS who are, who are responsible for housing applications and uh, improving the applications for better use uh, and for it to uh, conform to the DUT's um, sort of standards in terms of applications. But the actual application itself was actually developed by our own students at no cost at all. It was more of a voluntary work. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much for that enlightenment. And I'm sure if Tracy wants to contact you, she'll be able to pick you up from a website. Colleagues, thank you so much to the DUT team and Hamza Mandela. We're now going to move to our next institution, which um, is a new, they're a new institute. They're not new, but they're new to the CEO Pumalele FYE uh, work stream. And we have the Northwest University and Yannick Kun and Anna Motlochi are going to be presenting the FYE initiatives mm -hmm. at the Northwest University. I'm going to give them an opportunity to please share their presentation. Yanni very and Anna. Good morning. Very good morning, colleagues. Um, if you can give me a moment to share, um, let me just make sure that I'm sharing um, the correct settings. And once you've shared, please can you introduce yourself? Thank you. Colleagues, if you can just give me one moment. I just want to start the presentation and then just uh, swap my view. Uh, where do I go now? Sorry, colleagues. Zoom is not um, our chosen platform so um i'm just quickly going to uh swap right anna can i ask you if you can see the correct screen at the moment yes yes, yeah. can. yes okay. Can see the okay thank you very much um colleagues if you can just give me one moment i um see that my laptop charger is not plugged in <laughs> and i just quickly want to do that Okay, colleagues, it is really a privilege for us um, to be um, presenting to you today in this um, first year experience um, webinar series. And it is an honor for me to introduce myself, Yoni Keen, and my colleague, uh, Mrs. Anna Mutlochi. We are both academic advisors at the Center for Teaching and Learning at Northwest University. And I'm based at the Funabel Park campus. Anna is based on the Maiken campus and our coordinator of our first year experience initiative at initiatives from CTL, Dr. Shonia van der Westhuizen, which is based on Potchefstroom campus 
can unfortunately not be with us today as she is presenting at a conference in Japan. So her apologies for that. Colleagues, I am going to move on to just present an, a brief outline of our presentation today. Firstly, we will touch on our uh, strategic goals, our vision and mission, as well as relate this to the uh, CTL Persia Experience Initiatives and the Siapu Malela goals. We will then give the demographic profile of our first time entering students, and, and then we will explore our initiatives, followed by then how we approach monitoring and evaluation, and then also highlighting our limitations and gaps, and then of course, how we aim to address these. Um, good morning, colleagues, and thank you, Jan. I would like to outline our institutional context through sharing from the latest Northwest University's strategic plan titled Taking the Northwest University Forward 2024 and Beyond. The Northwest University have now defined six key strategy pillars for its next cycle, as you can see on the slide. Starting with the vision of the Northwest University, which is to discover new frontiers and opportunities that benefit society, advancing our relevance and impact. Now, moving to the Northwest University's mission, which is to benefit society through the provision of knowledge, excelling in innovative teaching, cutting edge research, and focused engagement with the community. Now, this brings us to the guiding principles that define the character of the institution. And these principles are weaved into our policies, procedures, processes, and practices. The NWU has defined five characteristics as follows. The first one is the sustainability, which is to adhere to principles and practices that improves sustainability. The second characteristic is transformation, which embodies the transformation journey as defined by the Northwest University's Transformation Charter. Next is digitization, which embraces the opportunities brought for impactful delivery. Then we have also the student centricity, which ensures that the student is the core of all academic and co-curricular programs by utilizing education to facilitate learning and active student engagement. The last one is to value our people by applying the ethic of care and empathy in our interactions with our staff and students. Yanni, um, can you please take us through the alignment with the Siapumelela goals? Thank you so much, Anna. So, God, it's the CTL First Year Experience Initiatives that we will elaborate on uh, a little later in the presentation are also guided by uh, the vision, mission, and principles of NWU that Anna highlighted in the previous slide. And it can therefore also be aligned with the goals of the Siapu Malela project in the following ways. So colleagues, the, um, the NWU guiding principle of student centricity reflects a commitment to place the students at the core of our academic endeavors and to facilitate active student engagement. And this principle, of course, supports the, the Siapu Malela's project aim to create a student-centered culture. If we look at the NWU's goal of improving and supporting student success, this directly also aligns with the Siapu Malela's overarching goal of catalyzing student success in higher education across the sector. As we all know, Siapu Malela also aims to improve institutional capacity for collecting and also using data um, to link um, and to improve student success. And this directly links with NWU's commitment to digitization as well as 
digital transformation, and this indicates a willingness to embrace a data-driven culture and a data-driven approach um, for impactful delivery, and this directly aligns with this goal. Colleagues, now Siapu Malela also seeks to expand evidence-based student success efforts on a national scale by using a networked approach and the NWU's vision of advancing the relevance of our impact also implies a commitment to making a broader societal impact that can really align with this goal. And then the guiding principle of transformation um, that uh, Anna referred to in the previous slide also reflects a commitment to addressing equity issues. Now, this is also in line with um, the Siapu Malela's goal of reducing race and gender equity differences in higher education. And then, of course, our commitment to valuing uh, our people applies not only to our staff, but also to our students, which then just also emphasizes the student centricity. So colleagues, all of this is also enshrined in our first year experience initiatives that we will um, that we will get into in later the, into uh, later in this presentation. This brings us now to the demographic profile of our students, and I want to start by having a look at our total first time entering students enrollments of 2023. Now, colleagues, based on our institutional uh, data dashboard. Um, known as the Strategic Intelligence Data Dashboard, we have a total of 11,758 contact students that has enrolled, and then we have a total of 1,485 distance students enrolled. So in 2023, we had a total of 13,243 first-time entering students, and then, colleagues, uh, you can also see on this slide the racial profile that we have amongst our contact and our distance programs. I then want to move along to also highlight the faculty distribution um, amongst our F10s in both the contact and our distance modes of delivery. And as you can see, most of our um, uh, F10s is enrolled in the Faculty of Economic and Man Economics and Management Sciences, followed by Education and Humanities. And then in our distance program, it is clear that we have most of our students studying in education. I want to then move along, colleagues, to our gender demographic and it is also very clear that we have far more students that identify as female than male and before I move along colleagues I, I also just want to highlight a major shortcoming of the institutional data that we have access to and that is that we have no data uh, that we can draw from our institutional dashboard about the funding um, that our students use, in particular the use of NISFAS, also the home language of our students, the first generation status of our students, and also another limitation that I, that I feel the need to highlight is that we do not yet um, um, let students choose to uh, have an option of identifying or choosing an option of identifying as non-binary or if they do not want to disclose their gender. However, this has all been addressed with the strategic intelligence um, department within uh, the university. Another limitation that I also just thought of, colleagues, is the disability of our students. But luckily, the BUSI survey um, can provide us with insight into the rest of these demographics as we have a very as a representative sample in 2023. And as you can see, most of our F10s um, are first generation students as we can then draw from the BUSI survey. Moving along then um, to our home language or mother tongue of our students, and you can clearly see that most of our students are Afrikaans and Setswana speaking, 
and then followed by Sesutu and um, Zulu. And then if we look at the financial sources, it's very clear, colleagues, that most of our first time entering students are using um, NISFAS or a, a loan from a, an, a, a, a private institution um, to pay for their studies. Colleagues, and then if we look at the quintile profile of, um, of our uh, students, out of the BUSI survey, we could also establish that most of our students come from quintile one to three schools, which of course then refers to our um, lower resource schools. But I, will, I really like to mention and to highlight what Lauren said yesterday in her presentation that it is really important that we are very careful in the assumptions that we make about our students. However, this demographic profile can really assist us as the first year experience school team, as well as our other um, uh, fellow academic advising colleagues that work with us to understand the background of our F10 cohort too, so that we can effectively support them. Kelly, quick question for you in the chat from Sue. Yes. If you yes. don't mind, Sue would I like to know how many first year students completed your BUSI survey? I have the exact number for, for Sue, which I will, uh, uh, for Prof. Sue, that I will paste in the chat, but it was just over 4,000 that Thank completed you so much. our. Okay. I'm Great. giving over to Anna now to just take us through our organogram. Thank you so much, Yanni, and thank you, Prof, for that question. I think um, we also have the exact percentage of the number of students who have completed the survey in 2023. So I think um, Yanni will be able to give those numbers. Um, as I continue sharing, um, let me focus on where CTL FYE initiatives fit into the institutional structure by outlining an organogram of where we fit into the bigger picture. Within our DVC's teaching and learning profile, CTL is one of the centers that reports to our DVC through the chief director. Amongst the directorates within CTL, we report to the director of faculty teaching and learning support which houses the student academic development and support domain. The Center for Teaching and Learning FYE is coordinated by three academic advisors from the three respective campuses of the institution. And colleagues, it is important to mention that like most of the institutions, we are also merely one stakeholder in the broad FYE initiatives in the Northwest University. And currently we have no funding as yet. Now looking at um, the CTL FYE initiatives that um, NWU has, we, we are in cu currently involved in the official Northwest University's orientation program. Secondly, we also have an extended orientation through the first year navigator and lastly, we've got the FYE website. Now, beginning with the FYE initiatives where CTL is part of by focusing on our role within the orientation of first year students. To give some background, in, in October of 2021, the DVC of Teaching and Learning initiated a transformative vision for enhancing the academic orientation of first year students at NWU. This was a call to design an enriched and extended academic orientation program to incorporate the exposure of essential skills such as study skills, literacy development, and time management for students. So as a result, the integrated orientation program for 2022 was proposed and as you can see on the slide, by including for the first time CTL student support services in the official orientation program as part of the academic orientations of F10s. 
I also want to highlight the three sessions that CTL presented during the orientation program. The first theme was adapting to higher education, the difference between school and university, a mind shift change, which aims to help students transition from high school to higher education by increasing their awareness of the differences between the two. It also focused on understanding the purpose of higher education, developing self-directed skills, and taking responsibility for academic progress and development. Our second theme was titled, Meet Your Student Academic Development Support Partners. With this session, we aim to familiarize the FTENs with the student academic development and support programs and initiatives available to them, such as tutoring program, academic peer mentoring, supplemental instruction, reading development, academic advising, and academic skills development workshops. This session also covered the role of academic advisors at NWU, where and how to find them, as well as introducing the first year students to the CTL web, web pages. And lastly, we also introduced the first year navigator, your gateway to academic success to the students. And during this session, students were introduced to the first year navigator site on the learning management system. And this happened after they received basic learning management training and its capabilities as an academic support and development tool throughout the academic year. And following this presentation, students are assisted in completing the BUSI survey to provide valuable feedback, of course. And we are also involved during the second half of the program to accommodate priority students that may register late. And all the CTL orientation presentations were also uploaded on the NWU's YouTube channel for students to access afterwards. And on the slide, as you can see, the amount of views each of these videos have. We had a total of 9,996 views on YouTube. I'm going to request Yanni to take us through to how we approach the extended orientation. Thank you so much, Anna. And uh, colleagues, I want to take this opportunity to give you a brief showcase of the First Year Navigator, as you can see on the video, and I wish if we had more time, I could show the whole uh, First Year Navigator. But um, as Anna mentioned, um, the, first year, uh, the First Year Orientation is merely the start of CTL's involvement um, in the First Year experience of our um, first time entering students. Now, recognizing the limitations of a single two-week orientation programs, uh, program for students is not only um, overwhelming for students, um, but it may also be fragmented in nature. So based on this, the, the First Year Experience School team identified the need to extend the First Year Experience um, beyond the official orientation program. Now, the first year navigator was initially conceptualized by one of our colleagues, Ms. Dean de Prier, and uh, we are very happy for, for her to give us the opportunity in um, 2021 and 2022 to redesign the platform um, to provide dynamic, timely, and relevant support to our students during their critical first year. Now, the first year navigator tool or platform essentially serves as a central hub where our students can then access academic development and support resources, which we then release at crucial points throughout the academic year. And um, I want to draw on a, on a very critical point that Prof. Sue um, highlighted in her presentation okay. yesterday, which we fully agree on. Um, and that is the just-in-time approach of releasing information to students as they need it based on the academic calendar. 
Um, and we do this through releasing various academic toolkits to, to students who we have that we have um, developed in collaboration with our learning technologists and our graphic designers. I heard a I heard a, someone. Is there perhaps a question before I move along, Kali? Oh, Yanni, we all good. Please okay, comment. sorry. <laughs> okay, um, colleagues. So as you saw on the video, we really opt for a design that um, resembles a sort of a social media-like experience. And like I mentioned, um, we adopted a needs-based, staggered and proactive outreach approach that ensures that our students receive the necessary support and guidance at the right time. And this approach was informed by, like I said earlier, the overwhelming nature of the, of, of the official orientation program and also understanding that our students have diverse preferences. And this is driven by the commitment um, by us as a team to facilitate a seamless um, academic transition into the higher education environment. Um, and in doing so, we, we really want to help them navigate through their first year, um, through developing effective, through developing um, um, academic skills and strategies, and also promoting campus integration. Now, it's very important um, for me at this point to also uh, mention that the first years are under no obligation to use or to access the first year navigator. And this is also not a credit bearing uh, module, um, but we do nudge them with frequent announcements to make them aware of the new information that we released um, that we release through our various academic toolkits um, um, on, on a monthly basis. Now, the impact of the First Year Navigator is really reflected in, um, in the site visits. Now, it's, an, it's important to, again, mention that students um, voluntarily uh, um, visit our uh, site. And, in February, and from February 2023, up until November, we had over 32,157 visits with 7,000 out of the 13,000 site members that recurrently visit the site. So colleagues, we are also yet to um, do some uh, um, data analysis on the 2023 data, but um, as you can see, this figures demonstrate uh, uh, the platform's effectiveness in providing on uh, you know ongoing support and this extended orientation to our first years throughout the um, the academic year. If we move along to our first year experience website, um, we also had a lot of visits in 2022. This was the web page. Um, amongst the CTL web pages that was visited the most with over 35,000 visits. And spent on the sites of six minutes and 16 seconds per visit. This year again, we, um, we also had over, 5, 000, over, over 35,000 visits, um, 35,541 to be specific. Um, with, again, an average time spent on the site of 6 minutes and 27 seconds. Now, colleagues, um, we developed this web page um, uh, so that our students can also directly access um, all of our student support information um, from the official website um, so that this allows students that may have registered late um, uh, direct access to services like um, academic advising and peer mentoring um, so, they do, so that they do not have to have access to the LMS and go on the first year navigator for that because as we know we have to deal with late registrations as we did this year. Now, colleagues, apart from using mainly our institutional data, as well as um, the BUSI data to inform our future experience initiatives, 
The monitoring and evaluation is done primarily through uh, the use of our LMS statistics tool, as well as um, the polls functionality. And through the statistics tool, we can do uh, various analyses amongst, uh, amongst this. We analyze the site usage statistics and the user activity events that relates to um, the first year navigator. And this tool really provides us with quantitative data on various aspects of the first year navigator, including the site visits, the activity of, um, of, of the site, um, the member engagement, and also the resources that the students um, uses on the site. Now, the statistics tool also allows us to track the total number of site visits and also then distinguish between the students who have visited the site and who have not visited the site. And this can really give us insight into the, the site activity as a whole and also to see which of our resources generate the most, um, uh, uh, the most activity and engagement. So we can then also draw detailed reports on individual student activity to monitor how our students are interacting with the first year navigator, such as um, whether they are reading our announcements that we post, if they all are participating in the chat room, and also accessing specific resources. What we also did during the orientation program um, our academic peer mentors monitored our chat um, throughout this time where our first years could post any question that they have and um, the, the academic advisors then just did a quality check every now and then to see if um, um, our mentors then answers these uh, questions in the chat. And, and that is uh, uh, also another um, activity on how we monitored um, our our uh, a chat functionality on the first year navigator. Moving on to um, how we then um, gather qualitative data, and this is through using the poll functionality that we launch uh, twice a year on the first year navigator to then gather feedback from our students to provide us with further insight into their experiences and their challenges um, that they face and especially, uh, and, and as well, um, uh, suggestions that they have for improvement. Now, this year specifically, we have um, really uh, received overwhelmingly positive feedback, um, but most of the challenges that stood out for us that students identified this year was um, their workload management, as well as technical challenges, and then, um, you know, highlighting their mental well-being um, challenges. And this then brings me to our um, ch uh, challenges and gaps that we've identified throughout um, 2023 and also how we, how we aim to address these challenges going forward. So firstly, colleagues, um, like I mentioned, we have limited qualitative data on student site engagement. So um, at the moment, we are sort of over-reliant on our quantitative data, and we really need to consider um, more polls to give us insights um, in terms of the motivation behind the use of the first year navigator and also why the students use certain um, or, or click on and use certain resources and, um, and, and not others. So hopefully we will be able to implement um, analytics tools to track user behavior and um, conduct surveys um, to also understand the motiv motivation behind why these resources are, are being accessed. Secondly, um, as I also mentioned, um, the um, limited insight into the demographic profile that our institutional um, a strategic intelligence dashboard can, can give us. And this relates to, like I said, um, first generation status of students, 
um, NISFAS funding, home language, disability status, etc. And we really need um, this accurate data uh, to enable us to uh, um, to tailor our content and support services for our diverse student body. And thirdly, um, I also want to highlight that we really need more faculty-specific academic development and support content, which is also another challenge for us um, to better align with our needs of our students in their respective disciplines. So a uh, collaboration with faculties has already happened, especially within the Faculty of Law and Health Sciences, but something that we aim uh, aim to, to take further next year is to build these uh, relationships with other faculties as well, to be able to integrate their faculty-specific information into the First Year Navigator as well. Moving on, um, I see I've highlighted faculty integration twice. My apologies for that, colleagues. Um, I want to now highlight multilingualism and accessibility. And we have realized that there is a great need um, for more universal design for learning principles in the design of our first year navigator, as well as integrating multilingual content um, to ensure the accessibility for diverse language backgrounds. Now, we are aiming to do translation of um, our um, um, content in both Afrikaans and Setswana, and also adopt um, more UDL principles in terms of um, inclusivity. And then colleagues, of course, addressing our psychosocial needs um, of our students. And um, the students have really highlighted um, the need for uh, mental health support or increased awareness of mental health support. And although we already collaborate with student counseling and development um, at, at our institution, we really want to develop resources with them um, about mental well-being that we can also integrate into the First Year Navigator. So colleagues, um, additionally, in, in fostering a more collaborative approach between CTL and uh, student life is also necessary and, and it's actually essential. Um, and al although we do already um, um, have existing relationships um, with, uh, like I mentioned, student counseling and development, and also recently our library services, we really need um, to encourage communication, joint initiatives, um, and at the end of the day, have to have a more unified and enriching first year experience for our um, for our first time entering students. Thank you, Yanni. And colleagues, in closing, we would like to emphasize that learning is indeed a process and not an event. This principle holds true not only for our first year students but also for us as the core team dedicated to enhancing their first year experience at Northwest University. As we've journeyed through the various sections of this presentation, it is clear that our commitment to continuous improvement and innovation is unwavering. Now, just as our first year students evolve and grow throughout their academic journey, so does our approach to supporting them. Now, our commitment to inclusivity, student-centeredness, collaboration with various stakeholders, which includes faculties and student life, like Yanni have highlighted, it underscores our dedication to ensuring that first-year experience at NWU is a dynamic and evolving process one that adapts, responds, and ultimately leads to the success and well-being of our students. Together, we are shaping not just this year, but a lifelong journey of learning and growth. Once again, colleagues, thank you so much for your attention and for welcoming us in this transformative endeavor. Thank you, Prof.
Thank you so much, Anna and Yanni, for um, sharing your practice with us here today. Colleagues, any comments or questions for Yanni and Anna? I'm just trying the chat. I, 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 oh, thank you so much, Prof. I, I could not click uh, the chat while I was sharing. I don't see anything in the chat, colleagues who are assisting us with the co-hosting. I don't believe I see anything in the chat. Um, Yanni, can I ask you, you know, your slide around um, some of the challenges we're having uh, across the institutions. Can I ask you if you have some more detail on elaborating on how we are dealing with the disabled first year student? Any insights yes. there for us? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Prof. We have a disability rights unit that um, is especially equipped with dealing with our students um, that have disabilities. But like I mentioned, this is nowhere um, um, uh, sort of, we have no data on this. Um, so in our application forms, um, I don't believe that there is any way where students can disclose that. But um, we, as I said, and, and I know Anna can also elaborate on the disability right units on their campus, especially um, on our campus, it is it falls within student counseling and development. So they have experts that then assist um, uh, that that assist students with disabilities, um, and they then have the specialized knowledge to 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 support these students. And then what we essentially uh, uh, do is then to provide that directional support um, to these students, of these students to the disability rights units. I will also answer Prof, uh, Prof uh, Sue's question in the chat um, just now <laughs> about the, the total number of, of students that completed the BC survey. Thank you, I think it's phenomenal if you've got more than 50% Participation. I haven't done the math, so my math might be off. It's but it's I not mean, more than fifty percent. Unfortunately, it is um, close. If, if if I did the, the the not very close, but it is thirty two percent. Okay. So so it 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 it's a, a lot more than we that we that we had in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two. So um, we really are also looking to to up that number next year when we when we do the booty survey during orientation with the students. Oh, I thought you said you had about 8,000 F10 students, around about 8,000. Um, Prof, no, we had, um, because we have both um, uh, distance and, and um, uh, contact. contact students, at the, uh, at, we have a total of, if, we, if I can just uh, get to my slide, 11,000, 758 contact students and our distance students is then 1,485. Perfect. Now we understand. Yes. Okay, great. But the total, uh, the, the total, the 32% that I'm referring to is a total of um, our our contact and distance students put together because our, um, our distance students also take part in the BC survey. Wonderful. Another comment from a uh, question from uh, Sue there. How do you manage supporting the large number of first year students? Because you've just said you've got about 11,000 and we've had that yes. at UKZN as well. And you've got the additional, um, you know, contact and uh, distance. So yes. how do you, are you able to bridge the gap between the two cohorts? Thank you. Um, so, so maybe I can uh, I can just elaborate on first of all just um, uh, about bridging that gap between the the contact and the distance cohorts. And luckily, and and it's it's actually so sad that uh, Dr. Sonia van der Wees can't be here today, but she will have a UCDG project next year that will focus specifically on supporting our um our distance students and that will then um sort of that we hope that that will will, will bridge the gap between uh between the support what i can say about um the the large number of contact students is um and i think that is essentially why um the first year navigator was actually conceptualized 
and this gives us a tool to at least gain and um, maintain contact with our first year students so that we can continue supporting them and reaching out to them via this platform. So at the moment, you know, we are really learning a lot and we are still new to this. So um, we really uh, we really value your your comments and, and any any um, improvements that that we can make. Um, um, please, co colleagues, you are welcome to comment that in the chat uh, in the chat to us as well. We are keen to learn from from mm -hmm. from the 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 webinar of the first year experience work stream. Anna, um, yeah. this I would also like to add on the question about supporting a large number of students that we are also using the peer mentoring um, students throughout our orientation. And when we present in the, um, during orientation, they also come and become part of support so that they answer students face-to-face -face and they also look at the Q&A platform on the first-year navigator just to put the human part to the, to the platform. So we're using also um, peer mentoring. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank for so adding much. that. Thanks for adding that, Anna. Thank you so much, Anna and Yanni. You know, while you are the new um, team members to the work stream, I can tell you that we are learning so much just from every one of the case studies today. So it's really a case of mutualism in terms of the FYE. So we want to say thank you to the Northwest uh, colleagues. We're now going to take a break of um, 10 minutes so we'll come back at 10 2 and then we will get into our final case study from seaport colleagues please don't forget there's an opportunity to complete the pre-webinar survey and it's just your thoughts your understanding your ideas even if you're not directly involved in fye you might be realizing now that like we said yesterday student success is the responsibility of every single one of us in our spaces here in a higher education institution. And then secondly, we will have the evaluation for today's session, which we will also put, Shamla will put the links in. Please go ahead, they don't, they're not, they will not take you long. They'll take you a few minutes, uh, five minutes or less than five minutes to do so. So thank you everybody. We'll see you back here at 10.2. Welcome back colleagues. We, are now going to commence with our final presentation in this webinar series. And it's fitting that we are finishing up with this institution, the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, in that they have been running their first year experience for many years. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Mosisana Mkonto, and I'm gonna ask her to please introduce herself. Over to you, Dr. Mkonto. Hi, good morning, colleagues. Um, I'm Nosisa Namkonto. I'm responsible for the first year experience uh, project at CPUT since 2014. So I'm going to share with you what we have done in the first year experience. Um, like all the other institutions, not moving now. My screen is not moving now. Okay. So like all the other institutions, um, FYE is aligned to our uh, vision, which is vision 2020. And it, 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 it's about providing equitable resources to all students and all campuses. Uh, like other, all the other institutions also, CPUT is a multi-campus um, university. Uh, where we say we have about a, a, a enrollment of about 35,000 students and eight plus minus 10,000 first year students. So the, 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 the FYE is aligned also to the, I'll switch off my camera so that I can, you don't get distracted. Um, it, it, our, our FYE is aligned to a university's focus areas two and three and also um, is aligned with the, with our graduate attributes and the CPUT project goals. Um, 
So the, the, the vision, CPUT vision, which the, the, the FYE is aligned to, talks about, you know, uh, uh, shaping graduates for a better uh, uh, world and also an, uh, um, uh, incorporate, you know, a sense of humanity into the graduates that we produce. And then our vision also talks about world-class students who does, research, who does research and uh, come up with, with innovative and uh, knowledge production that are cutting edge. And then the values, CPUT values, they talk about embracing culture of ethics and integrity, human heartedness and foregrounds Ubuntu, uh, uh, and also foregrounds unity uh, while embracing diversity within our students. And then shows um, enthusiasm, use technology, and also not compromising on the quality of service that we, we produce, and also embracing technology as often as we can. Um, focus areas two and seven, and with which FYE is aligned to, it talks about smart teaching and learning environment, which also this F F FYE, we, we encompass all that. And also focus area seven talks about smart engagement and learning experience. So FYE is aligned to these um, focus areas and, and, and these goals that are strategic to the institution. And like all the other institutions and also institutions, uh, FYE at CPUT also embraces Sia uh, Pomelela uh, project goals, which is one student-centered approach, use of data to improve student success, and, and talks about networks and, and collaborations in order to, to enhance student success. And then talking about the, the FYE program at, at CPUP, uh, we, we, we talk about um, the, the pillars of our FYE, which include institutional and faculty structures, FYE seminars and workshops, mentoring and retention officers program, online material, and also the CPUT 101. So I'd like, also like to mention that all our FYE activities are UCDG funded. And as a result in the FYE office, I'm the only person that is permanent. The other people that I work, I work with, they are all on contractual basis. Um, if we talk about the first year experience structures, we have institutional first year ex -com committee. The first year ex -ex experience committee comprise of um, a, a, a representative from all the faculties and support services. So in that committee meets once a quarter, and we share uh, best practices and challenges that we face re regarding the first year students. And also we have the fa faculty first year committees that comprise of the first year coordinators, retention officers, mentors, tutors, and, and class rep. So as a first year coordinator in the institution, I try by all means to attend all these first year um, experience committees that, it, that, are, that are in faculties. And, and some of these issues that are discussed in, in, in these committees, they are also discussed in the faculty's executive committee, executive committee where the deans will take up uh, student issues like uh, um, accommodation issues, financial issues, and they take them up with the highest office in the institution. And then also we have the first year coordinator. The first year coordinator is a lecturer in some faculties. The lecturer is given a reduced load so that they can take on this role of being a first year a, a experience a coordinator and dealing with first year student issues and activities in that particular faculty. Um, and then the institutional structure comprise of you know, all the committees. We have the, sub, the faculty and support units, and also we have the first year a, a, a experience committee, and then the institutional com, in the institutional committee, we also report to the Senate Teaching and Learning Committee, which is in, in the institutional a, a body. I sit in the in the Senate Teaching and Learning Committee, representing you know the first year experience, and then the faculty structure comprise of. Um, 
is chaired by the faculty teaching and learning coordinator. And then we have the first year coordinators and then the retention officers and tutors, mentors, and class rep that sit in that faculty first year experience a, a, a committee. We felt that we needed to have a committee in each faculty because we are outside uh, the faculties. I'm at the Center for Higher Education Development. Sometimes it is difficult to get into the faculties and 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 have these these pro programs and intervention. So if you have a committee that sits inside the the, the 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 faculty, then it makes it easier for these interventions to take place. So if we talk about the the retention and 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 a mentoring program. So we appointed the retention officers, which are senior students. Um, they they facilitate any warning, uh, the early warning system by monitoring student attendance and, and non submission of of assignment and also performance and, and in 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 assignments and, um, and 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 examinations. And then also we have the mentoring program. They, the students, they, they provide psychosocial support. And in and, and, and some instances, they even provide academic support for, for those mentors that are based in the same courses that the students are in. The numbers that have put there for retention officer, for this year, we, we had 40 retention officers and also uh, we had 237 a, a mentors and I also I, I did mention that they are all funded through the UCDG and, and the, the challenge okay I'll talk that to that when we get to the challenges and then they also have the, the facility the FYE seminars or workshops <clears throat> when the students arrive we don't want to overwhelm them with information that they are not going to use at that time so we provide them with just in time information that they require. So on arrival, we introduce them to the student to the to the university, who is who in the university, and what kind of support do they do, and and, and the support services that are available at the university. So in the first two weeks. We introduce them to time management to facilitate workshops on time management, goal setting, embracing diversity, and personal budgeting. As information that they would require and they would use because you find that students they come, uh, it's it's some of them it's their first time outside home. They have to 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 have to control their money and they 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 are struggling with that. So when the, the classes begin. We introduce workshops on on uh, on note taking, reading skill, essay writing, and 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 paragraph writing. And then when they get their first assignments, so we 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 facilitate workshops on information literacy, referencing, paragraph paragraph writing, and and plagiarism. Um, closer to writing assessments, and then we we facilitate workshops on. Um, exam preparation and understanding uh, question weights. So that doesn't mean that we stick to these only. There are requests from uh, faculties for other workshops or, or they want them to, they want us to repeat a, a certain workshop. So besides this that we, we, we facilitate, we also get a, a request from uh, a faculty. And then we also have the CPUP 101 program that is on our blackboard. It is it is not compulsory, but it is a multi choice multi choice program uh, that uh, students can can watch a video and then they respond to questions because, uh, for instance, if, uh, a video on uh, referencing. So they will watch a video, what, it, what is referencing and everything about referencing. And then they will respond to, to questions, a few questions, three to five questions. And then they, 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 they can, they, they are marked and get, and, and get, and get points <clears throat> if they, they understand what, what is going on there. So with these uh, topics, we want to develop a sense of belonging and identity of the students to the institution and also to, 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 to create a, an, an environment where students are tolerant of, of one another and appreciative you know, of who they are and also 
or how different they are from the next person. And then also we encourage students to invest sufficient time and energy into their studies. We know students, when they are outside home, they are engaged in unbecoming behaviors. So we want to, 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 to help them to, to make um, a, you know, a good, to take the good decisions. And then also we assist in facilitating interpersonal interaction, collaboration, and also some form of relationships with other students. As a result, some of our residences, we, we allocate them for first year students only so that they can have that kind, develop that kind of relationship and, and, and then be able to rely on each other and, and because they are all coming outside of the university unlike mixing them with students who are already who have, who have already been at the university and then also we support in these first year students in, acqu in acquiring a basic academic skill and then practices that that uh, underpin a successful study and then they need also to understand you know their faculty and the courses that they they are doing and we have find you know sometimes that you know it's embarrassing to find a third a student who doesn't even know who the dean of their faculty is and also students um, at the beginning of the year we find them uh, taking courses that they know nothing about so we are we, we work towards them uh, towards them getting information and understanding what courses are, are, are they doing and then what career they are they are following and then this is our the, the, the example of the CPU team. 101 a, a, a program that is on blackboard students that students can can access uh, uh, previously we used to have a challenge of having to register all the students to register the cput 101 as a course so that students can take it on but then now we have an open access where mentors now we are going to uh, direct students towards completing the CPUT 101 program because the uptake uh, previously was not was not good. And then we also have videos that we have produced. These videos are on a variety of topics, and also we have students. Um, as actors in these videos, but then they they are on several topics such as your time management, your your understanding of of um, uh, uh, financial uh, 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 management. Uh, during COVID, what we did every every time these videos get updated. During during COVID, what we did, we also thought we saw that you know. Uh, people, all the universities were going online. So we had to equip these students with online material, how to, uh, how to engage with tutors online, how to access information online, how to get into Blackboard and access your information. So we are forever upgrade, updating these videos so that they are they are relevant. The recent videos that we, we, we have developed now is on AI um, so that you know students can be up to speed about what artificial intelligence is about. So these videos can be accessed on Facebook, YouTube, and, and also on the, on the CPUT uh, uh, website. And then I'm just showing you the, the viewership of, of our videos. So this was um, in September. So to show that, you know, um, who views our videos and where are they are they coming from? And, and during COVID, the viewership of these videos increased increased tremendously and there were certain topics that we found that students are, are, are viewing them more for instance your note taking um your referencing and 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 and, and others so the, the viewership of, of of the most of the videos were increased during um a, a COVID. and also now we, we we also picked up a pattern when the students would view the videos if they had received an assignment. So they're on assignment writing, they would view, you know, the, the, the videos at, the, at, at, at that time. So that was the whole purpose that students, you know, we don't want to, to, to them to ha 
have information that they are not going to use. We, we, as I mentioned earlier, they need to have a just in time in, in information and that, that they can use at, 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 at that particular time. And then the challenges that we have in the FYE, FYE is staffing, obviously. Um, you work with people, but because people, all, all the people are looking for permanent employment, the one-year contract doesn't doesn't work for them, and they're also wanting to get you know benefits like medical aid and pensions. So you are not um, uh, you are not sure the staff that you are working with today to this year you will be working with you know next year if people and mid um, year people get permanent jobs and you lose uh, people. So that that's the difficult part. And then we find that also um, the, 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 the lecturers, um, they request workshops and there's an increased number of, of requests. And then also, I, 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 um, I, I, I think I, I, I didn't mention that um, the faculties from, from the CPUT 101 program, they choose topics that they will want, they would want to be facilitated to the to to their to their students and then um in one faculty they chose three three topics that will be facilitated through the communication uh, a course and then they also have made gender based based violence as a, a as a um, um a, 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 a program or a course that is compulsory for or for all their students. We know how gender violence is, you know, amongst university students. So they, it is made compulsory for all the students. And then find that the first year students, um, they don't respond to, to mentors. Um, these mentors, um, they, they, they would um, uh, 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 write to these students and some of them you find that they only respond when they have challenges. So in, sometimes um, they don't respond at all. And, and, and they, they, we had an, a, an issue of a student during um, when we, we, uh, uh, we had online classes who was sitting at home, didn't know what to do, but didn't respond to mentors. And then when, when they, they, the assessments were written, that student couldn't write because he didn't know that he could study from home. So those are the challenges that we, we, we are exper experiencing and also the late submissions of, of, of reports. These mentors and the retention officers, they submit monthly reports. So from these reports that they submit, we select information that, that is a faculty based and then an information that, that applies to all the students so that we can refer this information to the relevant uh, uh, people for action. And then also the referral system, we found that our student counseling um, uh, department is overwhelmed with re requests. So if we refer a student, sometimes these students, they don't get immediate attention you know, when, 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 they, when they are re referred because those uh, support services also, they, they, they have a challenge of staffing. And then how do we monitor the FYE activities? As I mentioned, the ROs and mentors, they, they, they submit monthly reports. And from these report points, we, 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 we choose what, what is faculty based, what is, um, a, a, a institutional and then we refer to the relevant people within the institution. So the faculties and support services that would sit in the in the in the institutional first year experience committee, they also submit reports on FYE activities. How many students have um, gone to the to the to the writing center? First year students, or how many students have have, have um, gone to student counseling and the, uh, yeah, and the support that they have re received, and then also myself as the coordinator for the first year experience, I also report to the Senate Learning and Teaching Committee about FYE activities at the institution. And also we have the HEMIS data where we we get a sense of 
who our students, whether they have, you know, moved from those who, who were in the mentoring program, have they as, uh, moved from first year to, 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 to second year? Thank you. Thank you, colleague. Any questions? Thank you so much, uh, Nosesana. Are there any comments or questions for Nosesana? Michelle, please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, so and thank you, Prof. Um, I have a question or two questions regarding the retention officers. I um, see that you have um, 40 of them. I would like to know how many hours do they work um, per week or per month? And um, how do they actually work? Is it a first semester initiative or is it a year long initiative? And um, what is the distribution in terms of faculty or the ratio faculty to retention officer. Okay. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, the retention officers, they work 40 hours per month. Um, we look, uh, the, 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 it's, it's a year long initiative. We, 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 we employ, we give them a contract for, for a year. And, uh, and as I mentioned also, they are paid from the UCDG. Um, the distribution of the, the, the retention officer depends um, on the size of the faculty. Uh, some faculties like the business faculty has got the, the largest en enrollment. So we give them a, 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 a reasonable number of retention officers. And we must, we must remember that um, um, the, 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 the UCDG funds sometimes is not enough for, for our, all our initiatives. So some faculty, they take from their budget and, and, and to supplement, you know, the appointment of, 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 of the retention uh, officers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, Mr. Okay. Sana. Then we had Sue. Thanks, Ruth. But I think Rosasana answered my uh, question in her discussion now. So thank you for that. All right. Any more comments or questions for Nosasana? Nosasana, can I ask, you know, the one thing that um, we can pick up from your presentation is that you managed to have the uh, decision flow work its way all the way through into the faculty, which is so crucial. So the appointment of the FYE coordinator within the faculty, I think is really, really something that is important to get the buy-in from the academic wing where you actually have the FYE coordinator sitting as an academic to do the work of the FYE program. And yesterday, um, Michelle, Okay, did ask a question. She was from UK, and she's from our College of Law and Management. And she asked that question about, you know, the, the buy-in and the impact, right? Um, and I think the fact that you have the uh, FYE coordinator sitting within the faculty level and not outside in a sense of teaching and learning only where the initiatives are being overseen and driven from, make sure that at the level of the faculty, the FYE, right, is important. So I think that's really um, a good approach in terms of CPUT. In terms of your CPUT 101, is this a module? I know you said it's, is it credit bearing? Uh, does it raise fees? And you have you moved away from it being credit bearing? Um, and, I, and, you, and you did say you moved away from students being enrolled for the module previously. Can you just give us some more clarity there, yeah. please? No, it's 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 not credit bearing. Um remember I, I even said um the, the faculty sometimes choose 
which topics they want to be facilitated to their to their students. But then with the CPUT 101 it, it being a, a multi-choice uh, program, we also have challenges of students not taking it on because it's not credit bearing. So now I, as I say, I, what I said is, um, we, we are from next year, way forward for, from next year, we are going to um, encourage, you know, to, to, to encourage the mentors to encourage the students to take, you know, the CPUT 101 so that to, 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 so they can have a sense of how they fare in, in understanding these topics that are very important for their writing of assignments and understanding of some important issue that can help them transitioning into the university. But when where these topics are facilitated in, in, in their classes due to the requests that we, we get from the faculties, so students can uh, uh, attend. And, 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 and I, 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 I didn't write here, for this year, we have facilitated about 63 workshops across the institution. And also um, we've reached about 7,232 students. Wonderful. Um, I know Rose has got a hand up. Rose, please go ahead. Well, I think my question has sort of been answered. When you said you provide just-in-time information um, and when students have assignments, that's when you do information literacy and what, whatever. I was just wondering whether assignments are coordinated, but it sounds like from what you've said, if you've done 65 workshops, every time, is it on a college basis, a school basis, every time there's an assignment, are you requested to do input? Um, how exactly does it work? Yeah, so we, at, 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 at that time, um, we uh, facilitate these workshops on how to write paragraph writing, note taking, referencing and, and stuff. And then for further uh, a, a, a development of their assignment, the students are referred to the writing center and we work closely with the writing center so that we know that when we refer certain students to the writing center and, and how, how they were doing in that particular assignment. And how long are these workshops that you do? Because it seems to be quite a lot of information that you, you yes, provide. Yes, it's about 45, to a, 45 minutes to an hour. Is it just a one-off or is it a whole series? No, it's a once-off per, per request. Some of them per request and the other ones, the, 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 the time frames that are mentioned. Thank you. Thanks. And also Simon is William. William, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Nodisana, for the very insightful presentation. My question relates to the faculty FYE coordinator, who is a lecturer. Mm. The first question is, um, what has been the impact of the, the, the faculty FYE co coordinators? If you can share that with us. And the second question, are there any... Uh, bits of, I mean, ad, is, is there any advice that you can give, share with us on possible collaboration between support staff and academics as we all work towards student success? Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, having a, a, a faculty uh, a first year coordinator is very helpful for us. Remember I said in the FYE, in the faculty FYE committee, um, and that is chaired, chaired by the, the faculty teaching and learning committee. Some of the issues that we discussed there about, uh, discussed there about first year students, they get to be discussed in the faculty uh, executive committee. So the, 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 the deans and HODs, they don't say these are not our issues. They engage with their issues. I'm talking about students who are hungry. The deans engage with those students. Students who don't have accommodation, the dean engage with those issues because they come from, from the faculty 
FYE committee. And also um, having students who are not doing well in a particular course. You know, those courses that uh, have bottlenecks. So the first year experience coordinator then can, can discuss those issues with the HOD in that particular course. So having somebody inside the faculty works for us very, very well. And this faculty uh, um, uh, 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 first year experience coordinator, uh, they also sit in the in the institutional first year experience committee where all the faculties are represented and where we share you know best practices and uh, uh, challenges okay and then the next question was about the support services um what was the question about the support service again i, I remember um, i just wrote simple um, collaboration between um support services staff and academics but i think you have you have uh, basically answered that yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. You've, you've the, the support, yeah, the support mm -hmm. services also they sit in these in these committees. So we 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 share with them, you know, um, and and that is why it, it, when I mentioned that we can also understand that they are understaffed, and then sometimes they can't get to 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 provide the support for the students. And another thing where we work with the support services is the training of our mentors and the retention officers. We, 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 have, we, we, we have student counseling that um, provide a session on basic counseling skills because these mentors and ROs, since they work with students, they need to possess those skills. The disability unit also is involved in the training of the ROs and mentors so that to get, to give these mentors and, and ROs an understanding of students with disabilities. And, and also the HIV AIDS unit comes and present, you know, um, a, a session to these mentors and, and, and ROs. So we, we start in the training of them. So it makes it Easy, easier for the referral and, and collaborations with them. Thanks. Thank you, Nosusana. Thank you, Nosusana. We've got one more question for you in the comment, and I think it may be from Michelle. It's about food security and accommodation. Um, how your approach to dealing with students who or cannot find accommodation and are dealing with food security issues. Any advice or comments on those particular yeah, aspects? It is, it is, it is a, 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 a challenge. Um, I am, this, this is what we are planning because the, the student welfare uh, only gives students a once off voucher. And this is this is very this is very sad because what is that student going to eat and the next day and the next day and the next day? So the institution is 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 is, is working towards securing you know a, a food bank you know for 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 students to get access to 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 food. And uh, um, what also I have done I haven't gotten a res a response because. Uh, whenever there is a crisis somewhere, the gift of the givers will go and attend to that crisis. I have written to the gift of the givers to, to give us, you know, some kind of food stuff that I can keep in my office so that when students are, are hungry, we can give them, you know, you know some a, a staple food, you know, and, and, and the non-perishable -per I'm still waiting for the gift of the givers to get back to me, so that you know we can have that stake in 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 the in the office. And what we also rely on is um, students who are living for other stuff. You know, the blanket, your blankets, your old duvet, your cutlery, and crock and crockery. Students who are living, we 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 request them if they won't don't won't need the stuff to leave it behind, you know, for students who, who 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 don't have, because we have students who don't have blankets, you know, where where they they are they are staying. So we also re rely on on, on 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 those ones. And then the issue of accommodation, we always um uh, work with the dean of students. Um, if the students is struggling, you know, to it, it, uh, to get uh, accommodation, and as as it, this was the issue 
just at the beginning of the year, students they were, they were sleeping in the passages and stuff. So we 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 do engage the the dean of the students, and some students would get you know accom accommodation when it when it is available. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nosa. I think Sarah. I think somebody asked for 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 an advice. It hasn't been easy. I must I must tell you, having all these structures uh, in place, it took it took a long time. But I can assure you now, we have all the faculties having first year experience com committees. But you know, you cannot uh, please everybody. And not, not everybody would buy in into what you are selling them. So work with the willing horses first and work so much that the others who are the skeptics will see the, 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 the importance and the value in what you, you are doing. Because if you want to get everybody on, on board, you will be discouraged. I, I, I must tell you, and then we're working with somebody within within the the the, the faculties also help. That is what we are going also to do with academic advising that we only started this year. We're piloting with one faculty, so we work with somebody within. We will have lecturers trained as academic advisors so that we can have somebody that we can latch on inside the faculty. Thank you. Well, Susana, thank you so much for your valuable input. Colleagues, we are running ahead of time. And what we'd like to do is just ask you as uh, participants of the session, uh, and it's an open discussion now, on any two or less uh, take home ideas that you have regarding the webinars. It could be for today, it could be for yesterday. Anybody want to share? Um, what you've seen as valuable uh, in terms of these case study presentations. You will recall that yesterday we had the University of Free State, we had UKZN, WITS, and the University of the Western Cape present the FYE initiatives. And today we've strengthened that with the DUT, the Northwest University, and the Seaport um, case studies. The floor is now open for you to just share and comment on anything that you picked up on in terms of these FYE initiatives. Um, and it can be within your institution, it can be outside of your institution. Please feel free to actually share. And then what we also want to do is we want to just quickly show you the, if we can, the initial data from the pre-survey. The data has not been cleaned and it will just, we will be able to just quickly run through your thoughts and your ideas on those of you who participated in the pre-survey as participants. So, and we can be able to share that via a spreadsheet on what you're thinking around the FYE has actually been. Floor is now open. Are there any comments, any further questions you may have for particular institutions or your take-home thoughts and ideas on your FYE or the FYE um, in the South African context or at your institution? Please feel free to share and comment. Sanet, please go ahead. Good morning, colleagues. Um, thank you very much. I found the um the case studies in extremely interesting, and everybody's take on uh, first year support programs at the different institutions. In the end, they all seem to overlap. We face similar challenges. We have similar demographics with our we have similar issues and it's lovely to be exposed or um, to see what different institutions are doing and that we're all working similarly towards the um, the greater goal. One thing that, that all of the presenters mentioned, and I am a, a FYE coordinator in, in our faculty, is that um, the fact that the program is not credit bearing at, at all of the institutions makes it quite difficult um, for students to attend. And um, in the end, I find that that the diligent student is going to attend class as well as FYE support sessions, whereas students who tend to, I think uh, Dr. Mkonto said, what is the word that she used, students who um, get up to mischief 
those who do not attend classes are also those who do not come to the FYE sessions. And ironically so, the students who need it the most are the students who are less likely to attend it. And that is what I always find very difficult. It's it's all good and well that we work with um, programs that we tailor according to student needs, which is what we all do. We, we work with our student needs, but those students who have great needs are the students who are less likely to attend. And it's it's more of a comment than it is a question that, that it is frustrating. And those are the students that need the most support and that we would like to support the best. If there are any other colleagues who, um, who can say how they go about to assist that specific group of student. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annette. So, you know, uh, we have been using the very negative language in our AMS uh, policies about a student at risk, an underperforming student. And perhaps we need to change the language to start with about a priority student. Um, we saw this with the change in the nomenclature for what we call killer modules. And we realizing that within the space of academic monitoring and support, that our approach has to be far more positive. And I'm sure Sue's going to comment on this because we, you know, there's this major overlap if you look at this, and I will do the summation between us operating in the FYE as the crucial leg of student success in that framework. So the pre-university, that, that onboarding acceptance phase, and then the FYE actually kicking in to transition that student is going to be crucial. And we've seen data where, even in our foundation programs, that whatever content we put, right, in terms of a curriculum, and all of these initiatives do have a curriculum, um, that must help the student to get the foundation. And it's that foundation that is the springboard to enable them to be successful in their transitioning from a psychosocial support in their transitioning in terms of their learning, knowledge, competencies, and skills. So eventually they are going to be successful to the point where they get to the to be a returning student as well as a graduating student who goes out and makes a difference. A key point has been around graduating students who exit our system and unfortunately exit with a terminal qualification because they cannot find and employment. Now, our focus here hasn't been on the graduate attributes and a work ready, right, graduate. But the reality is, if we look at the entire student journey, what we do in the FYE must feed into the actual graduate attributes and eventually that student going out to be a work ready graduate can, can make a difference. So you'll see in our curriculums, some of us are focusing on sustainable development and be sustainable aware citizens, being global citizens. And key to that is the graduate attributes. Uh, I know Sue had a hand up. I'm going to ask Sue to come in now. Over to you, Sue. Hi, thanks, Ruth. And you're correct about you know, changing the narrative because at our institution, we used to have these killer modules that talk about at-risk students. And we uh, changed the narrative to a more positive take and calling it our high priority modules and you know our priority students, which changes that. And uh, Sunet, coming back to you, that was our concern, you know, because our program is, uh, our first year transition program is a volunteer program. So although we have 1,800 students, we just had an assumption that those students were the students that needed the program. And last year we decided to look at the data and understand who are the students that volunteer to be on the first year transition program. So we looked at specifically uh, during COVID period, uh, the students because the numbers went up and we were quite surprised because those students that uh, were on the transition program were students with high APS uh, scores that came in. And when we looked at the end of uh, a year results, 
they were students that were between 70 and 80 percent aggregate, you know, uh, of their courses. So we were quite surprised because it, it we thought it was students that really needed this. But we don't want to make it compulsory. We don't want to force people to do it. So we still want to leave it as a volunteer program, but we want to target students. So, you know, that early warning system, identifying your students, looking at profiling students coming in, and then inviting these students to the program. So for next year, we've identified our high priority modules and we'll be contacting students in those high priority modules to ask them if they need help. So it's, it's um, difficult to decide, do we make it compulsory? If you look at the seven institutions now that presented, it's only UFS that has offered it as a module which they actually pay for and, and do it. So that's a conversation, you know, I think, as the um, work stream, we need to have those conversations as well. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you very I'm... much for, for the response. I, I appreciate it. Um, I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> I just want to no, say thank fine. you. I've, I've heard everything you said. It makes sense to me. What I also particularly like is I think that someone from the Northwest University says that they start with asking student what their de definition of success is. And that's quite a great idea to, to take entering students and ask them, what is your definition of success? And then how can we work towards it? Um, and then somewhere throughout the year to remind them that that the definition of success is what they had um, identified. And I really like the change of narrative. I think that is definitely a positive approach to supporting these um, high priority students. Uh, Ruth, can I just quickly come in? That was a very interesting uh, uh, discussion. You know, we asked our students to define student success and we asked academics to define student success. And it was so interesting that you had two completely different definitions of academic, uh, a student success. The lecturers telling us that, you know, if they pass all their modules, if they attend class every day, and all the things related to academic, while the students had a more holistic view of uh, student success, you know, somebody that engages in, in the class and outside the class, they bring, brought in social uh, factors brought in mental well-being and a whole lot of other things besides also including you know academic success uh, uh, what happens in the classroom so their definition of student success was much broader than the academics uh, definition of student success so that was an interesting uh, activity that we did yeah can I can I can I say something? Um, we tend to look at students that are not doing well academically in our support. And then there are students who are doing well, but um, the emotionally and otherwise they, they are not good. And I, I don't have data for what I'm going to say, but you find that those students they are the ones who sometimes commit suicide because they are interested in it catered for. Because we always think of supporting students who are not doing, you know, well academically. So while what I was, I'm thinking is about when we provide support, we need to provide support for all students, regardless of whether they are doing well or not. And also another thing that I've picked up, we tend to think that our first year students, they are the 18 year olds and, and staff. Um, the, the narrative need to change because we have students who are working, who are doing first years. We have students who are heading homes, parents uh, are no more. They are our first year students. We, we have students who are parents themselves who are our first year students. So I think when we change the narrative, we need to look at all aspects of being a first year student, not the, 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 the one that we know that first year students are 
18 year old straight from me from from a uh, high school thanks thanks from sasana are there any more comments or questions any more observations okay we're going to go in and ask shamla to share the um pre-webinar survey results with you remember these are initial results some of you might still be uh, contemplating completing the survey. If you haven't, we will leave it open. And I'm going to hand over to Shamla now to please share that data and talk us through it. Thank you, Shamla. Hi, colleagues. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, thank you. I'm just going to quickly uh, uh, there are some responses that are not uh, um, that are more narrative, but I'm just going to quickly share the ones that we were able to um, uh, to get some uh, nice um, present uh, representation of. Um, so we in this particular slide. Let me just see if I can make that bigger. Sorry, everybody. Oh, let me just stop sharing. Sorry, colleagues, just want to make it a bit bigger. Um, in this slide, we can see that uh, a num uh, the years in which people have worked on the um, FYE or they've been in a particular position, sorry, they've been in a particular position. So we've got 29% uh, for more than 10 years. Uh, interesting, we have also 22% uh, that with the position that they indicated that they currently are at the institution, 22%. Uh, so a lot of yeah, newer people too, the institutions. So I hope that the presentations have also been useful for them. Uh, we've got uh, uh, about eight people that uh, one to three years. I'm just going to quickly go through. I will come to the narratives. Uh, okay. Um, what was interesting is that I think the overwhelming response is that the, the first year uh, experience, whether there's interventions or programs that people felt strongly that it should be made compulsory at the different institutions, if it's not. And I think that would improve student participation, but also in augmenting and building up on students' competency, skills, understandings, etc. cetera. Um, most of the people that attended uh, the two-day sessions uh, are involved at some uh, level of the FYE initiatives or programs at the institutions. Um, we find that 28% uh, of people are, or, or that's about nine responses, are involved at the institutional level, about five at campus level. So we've had representation from different campuses. Uh, at program levels and then at college level. So a variety of uh, experiences and levels at which people work at in terms of the implementation and rollout of the FYE programs or at the decision-making levels. Uh, so it was Good to know that most people that attended this were aware of the FYE initiatives and programs. We had uh, one that we had fewer numbers that didn't know or don't know. And we hope that after these two days of the presentations, that not just those of us that are aware of the initiatives and programs, but even those that don't know would have learned much more. Um, so 50% of colleagues uh, noted that in their institutions, they think FYE is a compulsory. Uh, about 12 people said, no, it's not compulsory. And about seven people were unsure about whether this is uh, a bit, um, compulsory. 
Um, and as we can see that from the presentations as well as from people's responses, uh, it is run mostly in semester one and two uh, with uh, I think just one person saying that uh, there's also in year one and two that uh, this is run. Um, interesting to note that everyone, uh, there was a, a you know, clear um, understanding that these are holistic programs, that we cannot see them as separate and that they do more than just look at student performance and success, but looking at how do we better equip the young person in their first year and how do they then try, it's also about transitioning, not just within the institution, because at the same time that they are transitioning in the institution, they also are going through adult transition. They're transitioning from being a youth child into adulthood. So that experience and having a holistic program is wonderful to know that there are ways in which we then supporting them holistically. Uh, I'll come back to those merit and responses. Um, People thought that uh, interventions do make a difference. And that is, I think, what we are trying to achieve. And hopefully, as we develop and evolve in our projects and our programs and our initiatives and cater to the different contexts and how those contexts change, we hope to continue to um, be supporting the students and helping them. Um, here is about the evaluation. So there was a response to say they strongly agree that there is some way of evaluating the FYE initiatives at the different institutions. Um, a little a difference here in terms of the data analytics. So people weren't sure. Some agreed. Uh, some so there was some neutral response. Maybe that's an area we need to. Uh, we have done previous. Um, Seminar webinars on that, but maybe we could think about how going forward we can enhance that. Um, so if there's any other, okay. uh, I'm going to stop sharing there and then I'm going to look at the Excel spreadsheet that I pulled up and some of the responses uh, that came through. Sorry. Colleagues, while Shamla is doing that, are there any comments or questions from just some of the figures and tables? We haven't had an opportunity to see the data in great detail, nor to analyze it. And so Shamla has given us an initial interpretation and just an overview. Um, but feel free to interject at any point if you have any comments or questions. Over to you, Shamla. So we've collected information about which institutions uh, people uh, that participated over the two days came from. We have overall about 40 responses, so we really are appreciative. For the last two days, we've had up to 65 uh, people attending, and some of you have been attending on both days. So thank you very much, and we've received so far 40 responses, and if others are... Um, uh, still able to please, we welcome your responses. People have indicated which faculty they've come from. So you can see that, you know, it's from diverse range of uh, spaces within the institution, uh, education, from health sciences, library, so a number of support services, students affairs from teaching and learning. So we've had a nice range of uh, people attending and able to then um, and that also speaks to the fact that I think people have uh, stated before that student success in the FYE is everybody's business. It's not just, you know, in the teaching and learning in an undergraduate, it's everybody's business. Uh, and uh, that we need a stronger network. And what the presentations have shown is there is that strong networks across and collaboration across institutions at all levels to look at the program. We also asked information about uh, campuses. So we will be able to look at which campuses from the different institutions people have come from. Um, what is the main role in their institutions, whether they're lecturers, whether they 
working within the FYE and where at with the space. I've looked at the diagram around the number of years. Um, this was an interesting one on the, uh, now just go down that, what are people's understanding of the concept of term first year experience? So there was quite some interesting responses. Uh, I'm just gonna read out a few. To enable a smooth transition to first year students into the university environment, Adulting 101, quite interesting, a bit funny, but quite interesting because it is about, as I said, not just a student transition, but it is an adult a transition and how they then take better responsibility, become self-motivated, uh, self-efficient uh, in this new space. Uh, other responses, an initiative to assist first entry students to transition from basic education to university. Um, it's a university-wide program to support students as they transition in higher education. I'm just picking a few, but there are a number of interesting ones. Conducive teaching and learning environment, enabling programs, care-based pedagogical practices. Uh, there have been a number of uh, responses around the issues of care, uh, ethics of care, theory of care, uh, so alongside a humanizing, empowering uh, pedagogy or approach in terms of the practice and the curriculum development, how do we uh, infuse care aspects? What they experience for the first time of application entering the university, uh, being a first year student at the university, um, set up intentional initiatives at the institution organized in one place or not aimed at facilitating transition. So a lot of issues about what students are experiencing upon entry and how as an institution uh, we should be responding to that and what may be the challenges. Uh, talking about upskilling, how do we build on if we want to talk about a growth model and uh, youth development and link that to positive youth development. How do we not see them at, in terms of a deficit model, but rather as a growth, as having capabilities, as the potential that they can then within. Going to move to the next one, sorry, because we did ask a question on student success. So I'm just going to pull this a bit. Uh, um, and this is the response is to get first year students to graduation level. Uh, somebody speaking about con accountability, agency, metacognition. So, you know, linking the different types of transitions and what attributes we're hoping students to uh, build on. Uh, it is uh, making students ready for the world of the work world, which is important. Um, it is a university strategy to enhance student capabilities so that they can finish their qualification on time. I think that's also important. Passing each year of the study uh, in order to graduate. So linking very much student success to graduation, what capabilities they need or what capabilities they come in and how we then can augment and build on those. Uh, leaving no student behind, that's quite an interesting one. Uh, student development holistically, so not just looking at uh, students in terms of their performance, but psycho uh, psychosocial and wellness issues, helping students succeed and pass. Um, here on positive academic and social development in the student. Um, here it's about maintaining and the uh, uh, completion and keeping on track. Um, it's also interesting epistemological access, retention, and support, linking that to how we define and understand students' success. Uh, if the students don't understand the curriculum, whether it's the FYE curriculum or the disciplinary curriculum, that type of access is not there. So there's access to the institution, but what about the content and the different programs that we have? Do they have understanding of that? Achievement of desired goals that can be interpreted either in terms of student goals, but also what are their personal goals uh, in terms of 
why they've come to university and uh, what they, how they see themselves uh, into the future. Um, adapting, so it's not just about the transition, but how they adapt. Um, okay, so those are just some of the responses on student. Let me just see if I can get to the next one. We also asked the question about student transition and what people thought about that. Uh, so we've had responses about adjustment to the first year, uh, crossing sh chasm between basic education and higher education, uh, moving from high school. So very much focusing on um, that uh, link, that big jump that students have to take from uh high school and what they did and how they were taught and how they understood uh, university, uh, sorry, high school to what is now expected of them. It's about levels of uh, cognitive understanding mastered by asthmatic waves. Um, that's about transition, progression from one phase. This is quite interesting because the student journey then speaks to not just what happens in the first year because you're transitioning also to the second year. There's different levels of competencies and skills you have to master at second level, third level, and once you've graduated to the post-grad level, there's also, so the student journey is not just what happens at the first year, but across your uh, entire um, student life, um, which is what the next one also says throughout to university and beyond, a change from school to higher education, um, Talk more about the process of changing, uh, talk about orientation, uh, about being employable after graduation. Uh, this is also, uh, this one's important, a sense of belonging, because that will then uh, also um, support them in terms of their studies if they feel they belong, they are part of a particular community they feel a sense of belonging and awareness, and it may impact on how they then participate. Okay, I'm uh, going to move to the next one. Uh, okay. uh, we also asked the question about what are the key concepts or ideas that they think, because we just looked at student success transition, etc. There'll be a sense of belonging and agency, which comes through, I think, in a lot of the way in which people have phrased things, transformation, student diversity, speaking to issues of social justice, and how we then uh, build that into what we are doing uh, alongside it being a transitional pedagogy, a humanizing pedagogy, uh, student-centered, etc. Um, theory of care, as I said, that's come up uh, quite a bit. Alignment, uh, so if it's holistic, is it aligned to other initiatives? Uh, positive community development, first generation students, educational quintiles. So these are digital literacy, student biography and background. So context of the student and context of the institution. How do we blend the two together? And I think the presentations in the last two days have shown that you know, our visions, our missions, our teaching and learning strategies, our intentions behind our FYE as, as institutions, uh, just though we may be located uh, you know, geographically in different spaces, we are linking that to who our students are, what is the, their needs as a student body. Again, um, orientation, sense of belonging, uh, again, linking to the labor market, and I think that's an, a big issue as well. Are our FYE programs giving them some skill um, that may be useful for them, like things like time management, et cetera, that while it's linked to what they're doing in the university space, that will be important, uh, and issues like work-life, study-life balance. Um, Okay, uh, the next one is just a list of all the FYE programs. So this is about what we thought people think may need to be prioritized. And this is really speaking to individuals' own experiences. So 
uh, orientation and um, registration, recurriculating, uh, again, linking to the job issues. Uh, here, uh, the broad range of topics that um, FYE should uh, look at. App development, I think that's quite interesting because a number of the presentations over the last two days have showcased some of the apps that have been developed and the way in which technology is being used and is possibly going to be used to then um, enhance what we offer in FYE or any other programs or support that we provide students. Uh, curriculum re relevance, I think that's important because while uh, FYE programs are not seen in the same light as curriculum, it is curriculum because we are thinking about a mode of delivery, we are thinking about learning outcomes. So while it may not feature at all alongside the way in which, which disciplinary um, curriculum is given, uh, focused on, what we are doing in our spaces is about curriculum and how relevant that curriculum uh, that we are developing for the students. Uh, At-risk students are some of the things that uh, other terms Hybrid approaches, I think there was also the use of the word high flex, uh, blended uh, that came through in the presentations. Um, oh, this is interesting. First year reorientation, that's an interesting one. <laughs> it would be nice to discuss with the person who wrote that, um, their ideas on the reorientation. Um, this I think is important, time management, pregnancy. So we do a lot at institutions around time management, uh, HIV, a lot more I'm seeing on mental health, but there is the rise in uh, pregnancies, uh, particularly amongst first year students. And as uh, Nasisana mentioned, not all our students are single. There are many of them that are parents, males that are parents, females that are parents or they are caregivers. They are responsible for people back home. So while they may be studying and staying at home or are at residence, they are the main caregivers for their family, whether it's via financial support they're providing or the emotional support. I'm sure many of you experience students saying, I have to go back home this weekend because so-and-so is sick and I need to go in to help them. So those things, I think, in terms of context, maybe also useful to look at. Um, there's issues on mentoring, uh, orientation, advising, uh, writing centers. I think that's come up as well, even in the presentation. Um, customized programs linked to data and how we can have very um, uh, impactful data coming from the programs so that it drives how we then refocus our programs or um, how we then able to better uh, support our students in the different spaces. Um, library orientation, I think the digital and information literacy elements that have come through, not just in these two days, but a number of other spaces that we've been, that has come up as well. Um, this is also interesting, gender-based violence, cyberbullying and the dangers of social media. Yeah, lots of cyberbullying does happen and our students, uh, regardless of the quintiles they come from, they are exposed to media a lot more, TikTok, et cetera. And how are they using that? And how does some of the comments they may receive or things they are posting affect their uh, mental health and their performance? Um, seeing what other uh, ones I can share. Um, yeah, these are questions that people may have had, so maybe I'll just go to that and uh, so that if anybody in the team after the presentation wants to just respond to that, okay? Um, how can we implement FYE, uh, uh, implement an FYE course and how do we monitor the traffic of students each year and how do we simplify the course for first year students? Um, student motivation to participate in programs. I think some people have talked about that. 
um, but maybe others want to also reflect and respond to that. Uh, issue of funding, I think in the presentations, we've seen that many of us are relying on using GP, uh, but we also know that there are challenges with the, the, the funding and how much is available each year. And um, within the institution, some of the institutions are making funds available and formalizing. There was also a question around uh, certificates for uh, participation. Question of why attendance is a poor, poor. I think some have responded to talk about if it's a voluntary uh, program, uh, are students uh, attending? And I think just before we went into this presentation, I think it was Sue yourself or uh, one of the presenters was saying that sometimes it is the students who uh, don't really need and not don't really need it, but are better. Um, their transition hasn't been as challenging coming through the uh, support mechanisms, whereas those that are most vulnerable and most need of it tending to shy away, not really participating. It could be an issue around stigma and how it's perceived in certain spaces. How can academic advising support uh, play a role in the first year experience, holistic student support. Uh, okay, uh, how do we provide an integrated approach to support students, um, measure and evaluate impact of interventions? That's quite a detailed one. Uh, I think at this stage, um, focus on how do different institutions use technology? Uh, I'm going to stop there, colleagues. Uh, as I said, we have not really gone back and uh, hopefully after these presentations, the team will go back and look more uh, intently at these and see how it can then uh, enable us to look at our institutions, but also in the work stream. I'm going to stop there, Ruth. I don't know if there's questions or people have comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any comments or questions for Shamla on the initial data set? First and foremost, we want to thank everybody, all 40 odd of you who have participated in the, the pre-webinar um, survey, because as you can see from the data, the rich data that we've gotten from your responses is going to be useful in terms of us taking the FYE initiatives agenda forward within the context of higher education in South Africa. And so, you know, we can't thank you enough for sharing your knowledge, you know, your thoughts and your ideas about the FYE programs. And like we said earlier, it does not matter from which sector of the higher education institution or whether you're professional staff, whether you support staff, faculty or academic staff, every single one of us is responsible for student success. So your comments, okay, um, are crucial and as you can see uh, we've really got quite a bit of data now that is going to help us in terms of improving uh, what we do in that space in particular the practice um, when it comes to our FYE initiatives. I'm now checking that there's no comments or questions on the initial data set. What we will be doing in terms of the way forward is and with these seminars you would have heard earlier that Ephraim mentioned yesterday that we're wanting to use the webinars as well as the uh, survey data, as well as the case studies now to publish. Because yesterday we were asked at UKZN, have you written up the work that you're doing? And many of us are practitioners. We saw Lauren talking about action research and how action research is informing their particular offering. I can tell you many of us are using action research from a quality enhancement perspective. We're just not calling it that. But if we look at what people are doing in the monitoring and evaluation space and in the quality assurance space, it's very clear that everybody's looking to improve given the challenges they're facing at the institutional level as well as the national level. And the best way with challenges is looking at national and international benchmarks through a series of webinars like we've just done in the past two days and
just learning from somebody else's experience. I think that is the most valuable exercise uh, where you share, you know, your practice and other people can learn. I've been sitting back here and learning so much that I keep on making copious notes. I filled almost half a A4 um, notebook just writing notes um, on what colleagues have been saying in each of these spaces. And for example, I'm particularly interested in the governance structure behind these FYEs and how if we get the governance structure right, we can look at uh, having better programs. So wherever you are in whatever space, right, it's good to look at what is happening throughout the academic institutions. Now, in the work stream, we do have UCT, but unfortunately, they were not able to participate in this round. And we are looking to grow the network later on. But if Ram, um, once Sue has come in on his behalf, if he's available, we'd like him to just talk about the uh, third cohort and how we're looking to actually grow the work stream with more institutions coming on board so that we can share and have this community of practice through the Siopumalela network. Most importantly, and the final thing in terms of moving us forward, because we are looking to publish the case studies either in an edited book or through some journal articles, and that will be the next step for the institution. Very much in keeping with the Siopumalela goals around enhancing student retention and student throughput, enhancing the capacity of our students, as well as the staff. Many of you have referred to training, okay, and how we train the staff, and also the networking and collaboration initiative and the benefits. You can clearly see the benefits from the sharing of the knowledge and the information in the webinars today. So enhancing the scholarship right, of the FYE initiatives is what we must do now to document that experience. There isn't a lot of documentation of our experience. There isn't sufficient. We have a unique opportunity that given that we are Global South, right, scholars in this area. Um, and if we look at what the Global North is saying, honestly, we have a lot to offer by way of our voices as scholars on this particular topic, even as practitioners. So we're looking now to strengthen the scholarship of the FYE on the scholarship. It is gonna fall within the area of teaching and learning, but particularly around uh, FYE initiatives. And this is where the uh, network, the Siapumanela network will be strengthening us. We spoke about a number of challenges and I think the major challenges, if I can sum them up, is around this divide between mainstream curriculum and co-curriculum. And the truth is that the programs and the curriculum content strengthen and give success to the mainstream curriculum. So what we have to do is mandatory, you know, we have to make these uh, so-called co-curricular activities mandatory. While they, some of them may not be credit bearing, we have seen that they're mandatory. There will be full participation and improved participation. And if there's improved participation, then we're going to realize the goals all the way through to the graduate attributes ultimately. And once they're mandatory also, it does mean that the issues around funding, and the temporary staffing appointments now would have to be regularized if we are giving a precedence to a proper governance structure within the institution. So Seaput and Osasana talking about um, the FYE committees within the faculties, I think is really a good example of bridging the divide between all the key stakeholders where the FYE coordinator is an academic and they see the value of the FYE program and initiatives within the faculty structure. And that being reported all the way right up until the Senate, obviously through the offices of the DVCs of teaching and learning means that our institutions 
in terms of the decision flow and governance, then have to take these initiatives, um, uh, you know, serious in terms of the the offerings. I'm now going to hand over to Sue, who's going to do the concluding remarks. And if Ifram is available, Ifram, please can you speak to us about any uh, new developments or anything uh, around the network that we're wanting to strengthen? But I see Ifram is back, Sue. Yes, he just had connectivity issues. So okay. So I'm going to hand over to Ifram then. Thank you, Sue. Over to you, Ifram. Thank you, thank you very much, colleagues. I'm sorry, I, I was kicked out because we have, we have been switched off just a few minutes ago and our backup system took a bit long to kick in. But yes, ma thank, thank you to all colleagues uh, and in particular to all the webinar presenters. I think uh, that, that was a great team and with the great presentations, I'm sure we all benefited from that sharing. Um, I, I would like to uh, urge us to continue luring more and more colleagues to the work stream. I think we want to be a growing network of for practitioners in this area. We started as five institutions, we went up to six, and now we are at eight institutions within this work stream. I'm hoping that uh, next year we will grow even bigger. So this sharing, I think, is uh, the best thing that we can do in order to get people to be familiar with uh, the good work we are doing in supporting first years, but also in getting them to adopt some of those practices. And so let's try to share as much as we can through webinars of this nature, through different types of publications, but also through conference presentations. So thank you very much. Um, we will share the recordings with participants. In fact, we'll put them on a link and then we'll send them, we'll, we'll put them on SharePoint and then we'll send you the link. So thank you very much colleagues. I'm hoping that um, we will do more services in the coming year. The workroom team will meet and we will plan a whole lot of other activities for, for the coming year. Thank you very much and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Ephraim. Thank you, Thank you colleagues. Thank you so much, everybody who participated in the two days. Thanks, Chase, for now. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.